I'd like to thank everybody for having me here. It's kind of amazing to see this many people awake and sitting down, but even with a free lunch and a free what's free semi. But anyway, what we're going to try to do is cover a lot of stuff relatively quickly. And uh, anybody who does need translation, let me know because friends of mine are the fastest talking southerners they've met. And when you blend speed with an accent, it gets kind of interesting. And when I was a kid, the only people that talked as fast as I do were used car salesmen and horse thieves. So uh, <laughs> somewhere along the line, that's where I am. But this topic may kind of grab you as, as of interest. It kind of reflects two of mine. One is autism. The other is uh, the, the larger picture of, of at least the evolution over the last 100,000 years, which is probably when autism, or what we might think of autism, might have had its origins. We won't spend much time talking about that. But, uh, I want to start fairly quickly. These are things I want you to just look at and think about. And those of you familiar with archaeology, the Ashleyan hand axe was around for about a million years. Uh, did, it changed, it got more refined, but when you look at the amount of work went into that, it's obvious it was more than a tool. And so at what point did it become a sacred object? Or well, when did somebody stop and look at the moon and wonder if it was a god? Uh, the other thing is when did people start praying over their, their prey and treating it as a thou and not an it? And that's one of Joseph Campbell's uh, great contributions. And the third is, why would people crawl into dark caves to paint elaborate pictures on a wall? Uh, what were they up to? Why would, why would bother to bury our dead, erect monuments, create music? And above all, as a, as a social primate with language, why do we talk so much? We make a lot of noise. Uh, and in, in short, autistic spectrum disorder is a, impacts all, all of these. And it's what we'll spend time trying to go back and trace the neurobiology of why it affects this. But I think it's just a chance to put it in front of you. These are things that probably, if you look at it, may help define us as human beings. But it's obvious people with autism are human beings. So something is different. These are higher functions. These are the capacity to abstract and the capacity to animate other objects. And that may be what one of the things that's uh, effective. Now, we got problems with this diagnosis. First, it's a, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, but we diagnose it by behavioral criteria. And when you start doing that, you, you begin to either lumping or splitting. And you lump, you put everybody in one category like the DSM-5 will eventually do into autistic spectrum disorder. Or you start subdividing. And if you subdivide it based on biology, and neurophysiology, and neuroendocrinology, and neuroanatomy, uh, you begin to get more and more small, smaller populations but easier and easier to study genetically uh, and study scientifically. So as clinicians, most of us thrive in environments that give us a broader diagnosis to work with. But if you're looking at research, you need a much more narrowly endophenotypic type of uh, pattern to, 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 to study. And without it, sometimes we're in trouble. And I think, but again, either way, the heterogeneity of this disorder is amazing. Those of us who uh, treat, I've been treating autism for over 30 years. I don't think I've ever seen two people they're exactly the same. So there's a tremendous amount of individual variability within these core symptoms we're going to talk about. And perhaps one of the most intriguing explanations I've ever heard of autism was, uh, was a quote from, uh, attributed to Socrates, that the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, this whole population does not seem to have the skill to examine their mind or your mind very well. And so this is what we try to we'll get into. Uh, but again, Think of, it, think of this as a broad syndrome, as a final common pathway for multiple etiologies. Some are genetic, majority may be genetic. Some are a result of insult. Uh, keep in mind, too, it is impossible to, to walk in and zap one of your brains and make you autistic. It is a developmental disorder. So the things that went, go wrong, went wrong, happen extremely early. And they're not immutable. That's what the other thing we'll bring up and try to focus on. Now, these are the core symptoms, uh, and most of you know these. Uh, communication, deficits in communication. This is not just speech. This is some individuals have real trouble with any kind of communication. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even worry about the handout. I've changed it so many times since then. <laughs> but I changed some of this last night after the party. Uh, somebody tipped me off. But anyway, uh, but it's all forms of communication. Uh, you know, kids that are deaf develop sign language. But it's extremely difficult sometimes to teach some people with autistic spectrum disorders language. And those that do develop language may have real problems with pragmatics, the common sense, a social use of language, 
So that may be defective, even though speech is very fluent. People have extensive vocabularies and walk around like little professors quoting uh, people. Give an example, I had a patient who's uh, placed out of mathematics at our primary, premier in engineering school in North Carolina in 10th grade. Uh, did complex differential equations in his head, wrote the answer down. I asked him, how you do it? I see it. But he couldn't figure out how to get across town, how to get change, correct change when he got on the bus. So again, the functionality of his skills with this language, but he had, he had real trouble communicating. And he took a course in Shakespeare. And of all the things he had to graduate, that was it. And I just, in, in sheer terror, we tried to call the professor and talk to him. This guy's extremely bright. So what he did, he went out and got all the books in the library on Shakespeare by critics, read them all, committed them to memory. He's got a photographic memory. And so when he was asked a question, he could rattle off what 15 experts said. And he got an A out of the course. And so that kind of made the rest of us stop and think, well, that's how you can know a lot, you have a lot of facts, but not know anything. And that's the, that should be the definition of academics. <laughs> a lot of times we got a lot of information, but we don't know what the hell to do with it sometimes. But anyway, it's very stereotyped when it is present. And, uh, and very stilted in a lot of ways. I had a kid, first thing he met me, uh, he knew I was interested in dinosaurs. His first comment, well, I said, my, Dr. Barnell, how are you doing? Uh, do you know Tyrannosaurus rex was a late Cretaceous theropod? It stood approximately 15 feet tall, probably 50 feet long, weighed about six to eight tons, and it became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Some people say hello. <laughs> and it, but once he found out I like dinosaurs, that really was an avenue for communication. But you stepped outside that, he got into trouble. He couldn't, he couldn't communicate well. So the other is, is social relatedness. Now, this is a very complex area. Push the wrong button again. Uh, very complex area, and what we're looking at is reciprocity of social behavior. And those of you who've studied infant development, reciprocity is critical to language development, to social development, and it also seems to be an area that people with autism have particular difficulty in. And some of it's so subtle you wouldn't realize it. I've had people I sat down and talked with and thought I was carrying on a conversation until somebody took a quote out of Blues Brothers and gave it back to me. The guy was taking movie scripts and he put them together. And I'll tell you about a guy a little later, I call him Bug Man because he's the world's authority on cockroach mouth parts. He's high functioning autism. And he, he told me about what he does all the time in experimenting with people. Uh, he felt like a guinea pig after you talked to him. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the cognitive and behavioral inflexibility. To folks with autism, life is a ritual. The things that would bore us to tears tend to be very soothing and comforting. The things that are unexpected. Uh, you know, playing chess is far better than walking to a room full of sixth graders and trying to negotiate what is going on in this place. Uh, but again, the whole life becomes scripted. And it's really, when you, when you come across it within that framework, people can function relatively well, but if you start changing it, some people have real difficulty. The other thing that we you come across, a lot of repetitive behaviors in, in autistic spectrum disorder seem to serve an escape function. And it's mainly due to people with real sensory deficits seem to have a bigger problem with this because they just cannot handle noise, they can't handle consistently. Uh, Loud sounds, crinkling sounds, great, uh, vacuum cleaners. Uh, and so a lot of behavior is designed to, to escape that, to get away from that. And sometimes you, you get in the way, you get escaped. You go with them out the door. Uh, so again, keep these in mind because these are cores. Now, anybody old enough to remember Jack Webb? <laughs> now, a lot of you guys don't. We got the young guys on the hook this time. Uh, but he always used to say, no, just the facts, ma'am. And that's basically what you're dealing with. Dealing with people whose concept of communication is factual. In fact, it's very intriguing. I heard a quote not too long ago that in the old days, a computer was a person who could compute very rapidly. It was very good in mathematics, probably a savant. Uh, now, we design computers to match the human mind. Well, the future's going to be, you're, uh, you think like a computer. That will be a compliment at some point in our future. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. I want you all to keep in mind, anybody a Star Trek fan? There's Data and there's Spock. I want you to think about those two guys. And then the crowd on uh, 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 Big Bang. I think, I think that whole crew's high-functioning autism. Uh, but <laughs> what's interesting, if you read the script, you're fine. But if you try to step out of the script, you can run into difficulty. They're systematizers. I want the facts. I want the process. I want the mechanism. Extremely mechanistic. They probably have done quite well with Isaac Newton and people in the 18th century as they were starting to really look at the deus ex machina or the uh, 
world is the machine, man is the machine. Uh, whereas they're relatively poor empathizers. If you want to get a complete stone silence, ask somebody who has Asperger's or high-functioning autism, how do you feel? That's about what you'll get. They can describe something. Well, I threw my chair at my mother, but that's not how they, it's really tough for them to do that self-reflection, that uh, undiscovered uh, country that they don't quite understand. The other thing is life is science, is big science experiment. This bug man was a guy who was a cockroach expert. Uh, he said every time he interacted with somebody, he would sit there and he would do things and watch how you reacted. He recorded that. So he had this whole series of sequences of interactions in his head. But he said, yeah, I, what I have trouble with is I cannot do it at game speed. If it's slow enough, I can do well. If there's one person, I can do well. But five people, a cocktail party, he, he just runs out of the room screaming. He couldn't handle it. Uh, but he's a very smart man. I mean, he knows a lot about cockroach mouth parts. Uh, and give you an idea of social deficits. <laughs> I'm sitting on an airplane flying back from Detroit, and this guy sits beside me and just launches into this stuff. And about 20 minutes into the conversation, he looked at me and said, did you realize I had Asperger's syndrome? I said, well, I kind of suspected it, but you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. But <laughs> not many people jump into that right off the bat. And then, of course, there are in, the intuitive gaps. And one of the real interesting things in research now, are they really that deficient in intuiting and understanding theory of mind experiments? Or is it they just don't know how to respond to them? And that's been an interesting question right now. Uh, and theory of mind is how it's kind of inter-individual inter subjectivity. Why do you do things? You come up and ask me a question, what is your motive behind that? Empathy means I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to share both my mind state with your mind state, and the second part of empathy is what I'm doing that reflects what I think you're doing, what, what I think you want to know. We do this unconsciously. Well, the bug man was a good example. He had to think about that. And again, you cannot think that fast. We just intuit it and we do it. Uh, but again, this is uh, one of the areas of hot research in, in autism and developmental disabilities in general and in infant development. And right around 12 to 18 months is when you really start to see this stuff unfold in humans. Well, that's about the time you begin to see the, the brain expansion and some other neuro, neuropsychiatric problems that are associated with autism. And some people begin to be recognized as having this syndrome at that point. And then, of course, the other concept is coherence. Uh, those of you who are psychology majors or whatever, think of modular forms of intelligence. Little modules in the central nervous system that seem to take over certain functions. Vision, visual perception, language perception. Well, they are almost independent islands. That was one theory. Now, what happens is this all gets, in, it gets coordinated and it gets set up hierarchically. That's, that's where the neuro neuroscience has changed the, that concept. <coughs> But autistic folks, at least people in that population, really have trouble with, with coherent, putting all this stuff together. And while a guy can sit there and do calculus equations in his head, but yet can't figure out how to, to, to get changed for a bus. That's a very, in a sense, sp sp uh, specific piece of knowledge that wasn't integrated into the rest of his life. And so that's sort of the way a lot of folks are being to think of autism. It's this disorder trying to pull things together of abstracting levels of information out and of abstracting information and, and applying uh, many different uh, potential outcomes to individual stimulus. And I think that's where that behavioral inflexibility <laughs> creeps in. And of course, everybody has executive function, dysfunction. Most people over 55 have some executive dysfunction. And we don't want to ask, uh, we won't test anybody to find out. <laughs> but yes, it's kind of interesting. This is what pulls us together. This is what the, the adaptive part of, of, of human existence is. If you think of our intelligence as not necessarily collecting facts, but as adapting, it's an adaptive organ. And so what happens in this situation is that it's like the orchestra leader is gone. And all this stuff is going on on its own without any sense of direction, without any sense of planning, organization, coordination. And again, it's not directly dealing with any kind of cognitive process. It's mainly dealing with how you put this world together and how you make coherent sense out of it. And that applies to human interactions, to everything. So again, this is a fundamental process that seems to have its, its uh, certain deficits that sort of overlap ADHD, overlap tick disorders to some degree, which is kind of interesting. Uh, now, a social emotional relatedness may happen extremely early. If you talk to family members, and mothers in particular, they use most of the infant rearing, these folks will tell you 50% of the time, there was something different about this baby. 
and can't tell you what it is. I think a lot of them are looking at that gaze, that looking. And looking in infants and imitation in infants are two key ways the infant attaches and, and it seduces the parents to attach to them. So something in that dance is going awry. And even if you look at the vi some videos of adults with, with autism who are looking at conversation, of, of people talking and trying to, what emotion are these people feeling? Most of us gear to the eyes and the mouth and then the face. These guys go to the mouth to try to understand affect. And so their gaze patterns and their gaze preferences are different. Uh, they also have a lot of difficulty engaging in just routine play. And for many of the parents will say, I just didn't feel like I could do much with them. They didn't respond to me. They didn't want to be held. They didn't seem to enjoy being cuddled. So the connection between that interaction and pleasure, and the pleasure derived from it, seems to be impaired early. Uh, again, one of the most interesting things now is, is imitation. Uh, Five-day-old infants, if I had this my own kids, I, I ran experiments on them. If you sit there and stick your tongue out at them, and they'll, and they'll pay attention to you, uh, they'll, do it, they'll do it without having any understanding of what tongue being out means, and you don't know if they got their own self-perception usually, uh, recognizing self from others starts developing much, much later, they do it automatically. Now, right now, neuroscience is a thing called mirror neurons. There's a lot of controversy over this, but what this implies is by looking at a motor action, you're sitting there writing. The areas in my brain that regulate writing are firing off as if I'm writing. Well, that gets taken over by language in humans. So as I listen to you speak, you describe something, I see it, and I, I can and act it. Tell me how to, how to hammer a nail. I can see that, and these, these neurons are firing, both language and the motor neurons. They're interconnected now. Uh, and this is interesting when you start talking about that old hand axe I brought up earlier. That you can watch somebody do that, or somebody can tell you how to do that. And this is how we, what sort of differentiates us from primates, other primates. They watch you do it, and then they go out and do it on their own. We actually sit down as a species, sit down and teach, and really, uh, describe and apply language to learning new skills. Now, once that skill is learned, uh, it becomes automatic. Anybody ever tried to play the piano and sing? If you're good at it, you play the piano enough and you don't have to concentrate on every note, it's easy to sing. But if, if you're trying to learn something new, that's tough to do. That's got talents. But these neurons are interesting because they mirror what happens in the world. Well, what's fascinating, NASA taking the other side of that equation. They've looked at parents, again, mothers, since these were people who came to the studies, when the infant's smiling, areas in the mother's brain that regulate smiling behavior in the prefrontal cortex are also fired. So it's, it's a synchrony, and that's a big word in early infant development. And it probably is the foundation both for language development, for joint attention, for empathy eventually, and, and, and intuition. And when you say empathy is having a sense that a person has thoughts and feelings and ideas just like you do, and you can understand what they are, you can behave as if you, you do understand them, this becomes a very powerful new tool. And I think it's one that we can probably uh, <coughs> hear more about in the future. More, it's still pretty controversial, but I think it, it may stand the test of time. The other fascinating thing, the human face is not very reinforcing. Most neonates just glue in on a face. They glue in on a human voice. Well, some kids with autism just, uh, looking back retrospectively, looking at baby movies, they don't tend to do it as well, as consistently. And again, don't use that little give and take, that little sharing that, that goes on. It seems to be impaired at some level. Then again, in, uh, this is an interesting emotional memory. And if you're a neuroanatomist, this is basically amygdala type work. Uh, but I had a patient, very bright kid, she's going to Princeton now, incredibly bright kid, and uh, but one of these mathematic science kind of folk. Uh, and she would say, when I see people in the hall, I don't look at their face to know who they are. And since they can't, she can't get emotional, can't evoke memories of that person that have anything to do with any emotional experience like most of us do. She remembers their tone of voice or the way they scratch the side of their head when they talk, but doesn't rely on the things that you intuit. And so it's really fascinating here to describe it. And this is an area called a fusiform facial, uh, facial processing area in the inferior temporal cortex. And this is an interesting one because this area lights up when a face shows up. And as we get more and more practice with, uh, with faces, it doesn't light up anymore. But the fascinating thing about it is when you look at people with autism, they process objects in this area. 
And so they, and there's a study of this month, American Academy Journal, I think, uh, on uh, infants, very early, young infants who prefer looking at geometric shapes to human faces and the risk that poses for autism during development. Again, not locking in on a human face. And if you watch people who deal with babies, I mean, it's just, that's a, a love dance that it's hard to, to match. Uh, then, of course, the whole thing of linking faces, objects, experiences, to emotions, to rewards. And this is one of the intriguing things that uh, Lovas and people have stumbled into when trying to teach, intervene very early. Uh, and uh, Stanley Greenspan and other people have gone and said, let's add the emotional component, see what we can do with it. And it really has been fascinating. And the argument's going to be the earlier you can intervene and try to deal with some of this, the better chances you got. Well, now, social communication. We do this all the time. We don't even think about it. We don't think about the rules of engagement. We don't think about planning out what we're going to say next. If you say something, I respond. And it, that can sustain the conversation. But with some folks with autism, that doesn't work very well. They've got a script. You follow it, things are OK. Step outside it, something that's been rehearsed, something that's familiar, you, know, you begin to run into difficulty. It's tough to generate language. <coughs> the other thing is over time, thought, in a sense, uh, begins to take the place of language. It occurs coincidental with language, but uh, becomes important as a, as a sphere of action. And this has been one of the really intriguing observations that has been made. If you look at the, the neurology of certain types of uh, uh, aphasias, it looks as if our lexicon, our list of nouns, for more a better term, is in the anterior temporal cortex. The rules for grammar are in the inferior frontal cortex, in Broca's area. Well, Broca's area is also was in, in primates an area that was controlling complex motion, complex motor movement, especially in the hands, face. Uh, and so what, what you run into is, uh, but it, interesting, you damage that area, people have more trouble with verbs, adverbs, than nouns. They have trouble with syntax. And so one word, come, uh, may be a whole system of communication. You have to get mad at you and call you a lot of names. But when some people can sing, but they can, can sing what they want to say. <coughs> but it's fascinating, because what we normally, we just put that together. One of the arguments with coherence is that may not necessarily happen. That what is heard, what's understood as a word, may not necessarily then be applied to a sentence, or be used in a sentence, or to guide action, uh, which normally does. Now that's, that's getting in the extremely intell severe intellectual disability range, but uh, these are kind of concepts that, that trying to put what happens in the brain itself and, and come out with a coherent stream of behavior that's socially uh, directed is difficult. Uh, very early, maybe less responsive to human voices and to mother's voice. I mean, if you guys have seen the, the videos of first birthdays that were used in uh, some of the research that <coughs> the Yale group, <coughs> the Yale folks were doing, what they did, they took infants and just videotaped them at their first birthday. Now, some of these were high risk because they had an autistic sibling already. Uh, but what they noticed was the kids didn't respond to their name, didn't seem to engage much in, in interactions with anybody and would be more interested in repetitive activities. And this is at one. Now, this is about the lowest, this is about the time when the brain suddenly is expanding. Look at the brain size of people, young infants and toddlers with autism. It's much, much larger than normal. And then later, by adulthood, that, that has disappeared. And it's during this time that something's going with, you know, cells are multiplying, cells are maturing in an odd fashion. But this is the time when symptoms begin to appear. And if you look at how most people would reckon, think of uh, autism when, it, it was, when, when words start having to be put together. One word, one description, one thing, now it becomes a sentence. And that seems to be the area when you really begin to see symptoms early. And this is what generative power is. Uh, it's interesting if you know B.F. Skinner, disciples, uh, there's a big argument of how language occurs. Is it simply reinforced strings of behavior? Uh, or is language something more complicated? And, and Chomsky, who was a big neurodegenerative uh, generative guy, he argued that we have this innate language device that processes language and is cured, geared to language. 
Now, probably what happens is we have areas that have the potential to develop language, but we train them. And, we can, and, and one of the things that's so interesting about joint attention is that joint attention works very well for nouns. You're holding a little baby and you're all looking at it together, you say, there's a tree. Uh, whereas action, again, is a slightly different process. Uh, and that may not get put together quite as easily as you hope. But these are all part of this theory of mind, this evolving reciprocity. And these are infants. We're not talking about adults. And so what the ideal goal would, what the goal would be for everybody, can we recognize this extremely early and start intervening? In the best research right now, maybe six, 12 months, maybe six, 18 months might be the, the lower end where we can start to recognize it. And keep in mind, that's about the time when all these neurobiologic changes are showing up. And what about genetics? Uh, you know, when I, was, I was taught genetics back in medical school, it was simple. You know, it's kind of like infectious disease or immunology. You've been away from it too long, you pick a textbook up, you need a dictionary to figure out what the words are. It doesn't take long. But this is a highly heritable disorder. I mean, the rates of uh, heritability is the probability that something was inherited, what the percentage of the variance comes from, from genes. And we got 90%. Now, who knows what that means? This means it's 90%. Uh, but the way we're beginning to understand genes now, it's not just the genes and the structure of the genes themselves, but what happens, what regulates them. That's the key variable. Uh, but again, if you look at families, and you look at families of, with, with one child with autism out of all the rest, they got four other normal kids and one kid with autism, hypothetical. You look at that family, you may not see the clustering of, of autism or autism spectrum or what's called broad behavioral phenotype in the family. You may find other genetic disorders. That may be that 10% or so that have known genetic disorders associated with autism. You look at families that have more than one kid. And you start, okay, does it, if you have one kid with autism, there's about a 3 to 5% chance you'll have two, which is about 20 times, 20, 30 times what the rate would be. Uh, if you have two, it's about the same percentage. So what, what happens, these families have, I got families with three and four autistic kids in them. And they're really interesting because what you then begin to see is look at the family, extended family, especially first degree relatives, parents, grandparents. Uh, you begin to see these kind of quirky little traits these folks have. And this is a concept of expanded phenotype. What this may be is that this group is probably the inherited group. This group tends to be a higher functioning group. This group also tends to, because they don't have biases introduced by intellectual disability. But this group also is predominantly male, more so than some of the other autism, forms of autism. So there's three characters you've got to think about. One is what that Y chromosome, what that unopposed X chromosome in the male is doing. Uh, but also, what the, the, right now, probably 105, I think, last time I looked, 105 rare genes that are associated with autism to some degree. And so what you're looking at is if you see a cluster in a family, three or four autistic kids, you look at their first cousins, it's, it's down 10% of that. What you're looking at is probably a polygenic collection of symptoms. In other words, you got a, a, a threshold effect. I got 35 genes I developed full syndrome autism. I got five I don't, but I'm a little bit unusual. I have social communication deficits, especially in prag pragmatic uh, uh, skills, uh, how to use language socially. And I also have the tendency to speak very stereotypically, very fixed phrases. Kind of like a lot of politicians. Uh, <clears throat> now, what they're looking at now is single nucleotide poly polymorphisms, all these odd copy number variants. Uh, most interesting we got is got several people with uh, 15Q duplication syndrome, Q13. The Prader-Willi and Algeman's gene is, that, is a, a missing part in that gene. This is a duplication of it. And you see much higher rates of, uh, of uh, autism, much higher rates of epilepsy, and other uh, subtle developmental disabilities, motor disabilities. So these, but that probably is not the only, it's not a cause, it's a contributing factor. Maybe 30 or 40 other genes have to come together to produce this syndrome, or 20. <coughs> Nobody knows for sure. The other thing is, is epigenetics. This has been really interesting. This is what happens when, as a, as they, for, as interesting studies have been in rats. Uh, take rat pups. You've got a mother who licks the rat pup and grooms it. You know, L is licking grooming behaviors. Called. Uh, that shapes the whole structure of neuroendocrine system, and especially the stress response system. Animals that lack that are extremely stressed. And, of course, Harry Harlow years ago took 
infant macaques, put them on wire cage moms, and they were, and you looked at those kids, the kids, the baby rhesus macaques, uh, they were hyperactive, they were terrified of social contact, they were aggressive, self-injurious, they had a lot of really odd behaviors. So this boundary between what changes the genes affecting this and what is a genetic disorder is, is going to be really up in the air for a while. Uh, I think it's really fascinating to see this coming out uh, and how you can, in, in one sense, uh, I guess Rett syndrome is probably the, one of the better examples. Well, uh, genes are deactivated uh, and histones are, uh, the his, histones are inactive DNA. But anyway, what that does, it turns off a specific set of genes that have to do with glutamate production, uh, glutamate, uh, sin, uh, GABA production from glutamate. But these are all kind of interesting things that, uh, and now the uh, area I'm interested in is uh, mitochondrial diseases. And uh, these are beginning to creep in. And the majority of these are coming from mothers, simply because the egg, mitochondria have their own separate DNA, and it comes, and it's, it comes from the egg. Now, there are about three-fourths of its genes come from the, the nucleus, so that's not going to show that distribution. A lot of the, the major mitochondrial disorders are uh, maternally passed. If you look at the, a pedigree, you see a mom, a mom, a mom, and a son, and a daughter, and a son, and a daughter. All these, this, everybody gets affected. Uh, so it really doesn't look like the other patterns. But this is a major, uh, has major responsibility in terms of energy production. And if you think of what cells are most effective, uh, would be those that have the highest metabolic rates. And brain takes about 20% of our total glucose intake in the day to keep it going. Uh, so it's an expensive organ. And it's, but so mitochondrial dysfunction is going to show, may show up behaviorally at first. And then all these higher order functions. If you look at how sensory information is brought in, it's first brought in at a very elemental level. You look at the EEG, it's in the N50 range, P, P, P and N100 range. As it moves through the system, it becomes more and more refined and more and more blended in with other bits of information. So by the time you get to the, the later phases on that EEG, it's already information that's no longer directly relevant to what you're listening to, what it's activating in your brain. You wait 600 milliseconds, you've got a whole other, uh, the brain's just processing this stuff, and it's doing it extremely rapidly. And this may be one of the areas in, in autism that, that things may be going awry. And again, we have to tease out that from intellectual disability. But it's another one of these possibilities. And it's usually the cortexes that evolve last, what I call heteromodal cortexes. They generally evolve with abstract reasoning, abstract behavior. Prefrontal cortex, inferior parietal cortex, temporal parietal junction, all these areas are going to be very late maturing and maybe profoundly affected by this disorder. Uh, and, and then, you know, this is gene, age and brain, genes and development. But this is another intriguing thing. Why are males more affected than females? Uh, and this is a, a question that applies to Tourette's disorder, applies maybe to ADHD. Uh, it's getting a little controversial, and actually always underdiagnosed females. Uh, and it may be there's something in balance between that X and Y chromosome, uh, or the Y chromosome that we don't understand yet. Uh, but a lot of disorders of that X chromosome, uh, hence fragile X, uh, may have some uh, autistic-like qualities. It may not necessarily be autistic, but nearly a third have some characteristics of autism. Age of onset. We don't know when age of onset is. We assume it's in utero. And we also assume that somewhere around the first year, things start to change and change in a kind of downward direction. And as you have later and later onset, especially with the... Uh, uh, three or four or five when people really develop the uh, disintegrative disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, you begin to see clear neurological diseases involved. A lot of lipidosis, a lot of neurodegenerative disorders. You move forward to autism, and very early traits may be more strongly inheritable, and, uh, but you still have to separate out intellectual disability. The level of IQ, level of adaptive behavior just from ID will influence how we uh, understand this disorder. And it, a lot of comorbidity overlap. Uh, there's overlap with ADHD, some of the neurophysiology of ADHD, some of the neurophysiology of uh, Tourette's disorder. There's some that a lot of people get labeled OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of energy to try to tease those out. Uh, but it, most of the repetitive behaviors in autism aren't necessarily those that uh, are commonly seen in classic OCD. There's a lot of battling now of what 
Is OCD, is it simply contamination and, and cleaning? Is it doubting and checking? What do you do with counting, touching, arranging, organizing, ordering, hoarding, fingernail biting, all these other things that fall in that spectrum that probably aren't necessarily OCD. People with autism kind of look at the other end. They don't look like classic OCDs. They don't look like them pharmacological. Anybody who treats OCD, you, you put mega doses and you wait 16, 18 weeks before you say something's not going to work. Most of the parents, if you talk to them, you get put on the SSRI, they respond the next day. And at doses that are just ridiculous. I got people with two and a half, two milligrams, one milligram of fluoxetine. They can't tolerate it anymore. And if you stop it, they relapse immediately. If you put them on a tryptophan depleted diet, they, they collapse. Very much like people with depression do, do but not OCD. Uh, so again, there are a lot of very fundamental differences. And the course may be different. And the comorbidity and actual typology may be different. But they overlap. And I think a lot of people, we, I see a lot of people get labeled obsessive compulsive disorder and they have a diagnosis of autism. And another problem is if you look at ADHD, you look at attention deficits, it's probably a part of every psychiatric disorder. It's part of life. When Eric sits down and starts going through these differential equations, he can do one. This guy, by the way, he uh, helped design the uh, Mars lander. He, he designs breaking system, interplanetary braking systems. When the balloons come out and it slows down in the atmosphere, that was his baby. And uh, he comes in and starts rifling these equations. I've got a real attention deficit disorder. Because I don't know what the guy's talking about. I understand a little calculus, but to get level, he goes, whoa. Uh, but again, these multiplex families, uh, are, his, he had an older brother was sort of an unusual character. And both his parents were really fascinating people to know. They were both scientists. And uh, the joke used to be if you wanted to find high functioning autism, go into physics and mathematics department at UNC, and you could look at their children, you found them all. Because <laughs> this is a type of folks, and this is what's going to be interesting when we come back, at, if I get a chance at the end, to really talk about the evolutionary biology of this disorder. Now, again, we talked about the singletons, the, the one child. Now, one of the problems with some families is they have one child who's autistic, and they stop having children. They don't have any more. And that's going to be a different than somebody who has three normal kids and then, quote, has an autistic child. That may be very different, but they still are going to have one child in the family. But then the genetic links for that group are very, very different than people with three or four autistic folks. Imaging studies, uh, again, this is, these are all areas that are impacted. Uh, it's interesting, the amygdala uh, is, is, in animal models, is as close to autism as we can look, but it has to occur early. You can't damage the amygdala now. Your amygdala is expected to be autistic. You might become fearless. There's an old story about the, again, the poor rhesus macaques taken on the chin in science, but uh, this little macaque was in a cage. You got a video of this. And, uh, and most primates are scared to death of snakes. And so what happened is that uh, they bring a rubber snake to the macaque. He just goes crazy because he can't get out of the cage. And then, then they do the amygdalectomy. They take both amygdalae out. And then they bring it back to him. He picks it up, licks it, bites it, plays it with a whip. Has no fear of it at all. Now, if you do that early in developmental sequence, it's horrible. I mean, they have no, social, no capacity to read social emotions or, so, or relate to folks at all. It's very terrifying to watch it. Again, all these areas are interconnected, though. And so there are three or four levels of development. One, the other interesting is the rapid brain growth that occurs in that first year, after the first year. It just suddenly is, is substantially larger. And then, then the decellularization. Well, a lot of that people are one of these immature cell types, uh, synaptic connections that don't work right, and so are being pruned, uh, but it's unclear. You look at most of the growth in the human brain, it's not in gray matter. Because that will grow and then be pruned off. Uh, it's in white matter. And so the interconnections between all these tracks. And it's, it's the surface area of the brain that may be critical. But all, what's happening, no, nobody completely understands this. But it overlaps when we start to recognize things that look autistic. And of course, all of these chemical electric synapses, the electrical synapses have been the most interesting in the last few years. We know about the chemicals, that's serotonin, dopamine. But these are in, uh, gap junctions in neurons that communicate information back and forth. And they usually manifest in the, in the brain waves with these odd kind of patterns of rhythmic behaviors of the, of the theta range. As a, and a lot of people think that's the idling frequency of the central nervous system. That we're processing much more information in that state than we are when we're alert and paying attention. 
And so when you're bored, you're probably doing your best thinking. So y'all get good and bored. Uh, and then, of course, the provocative studies. And these are ones like you punch somebody and see how they react. You punch the brain, give it something to do, and then you measure how it changes. Well, this is where they got to understand the stuff about facial process and how you approach complex problems and how at least some very young children prefer geometric form to human faces. Uh, but again, this is the, the kind of high-tech stuff. I think this is where it's really getting exciting because now they're beginning to actually look at these functional studies while people are, are performing tasks, getting some idea how all this is put together. Because uh, I think it was, uh, who, who made this quote, but if we give you a job, it was to go to Radio Shack and buy all the parts you need for a human brain and put it together. So this is what I think this is, some of these neuroimaging studies were, were like. They were kind of breaking it down in little parts. And a friend of mine used to call it the 21st century uh, phrenology. That you look at the bumps on the head and you predict what's going on because of that bump's there. And if any of you saw uh, uh, Young Frankenstein, uh, about Mel Brooks, he got, he's got a good scene in that about the bumps on the head. But you got, people forget that Gauss was one of the premier neurobiologists of his time when he developed that. But, but again, this is all kind of a complex, and this is looking at the function, this is the interconnectedness. And that's what this, these kind of studies will help us understand. Uh, and, I, and one of the interesting things is that the cerebellum is very much affected by autism in many people. And uh, what Margaret Bauman and people noticed a long time ago is that there are certain cell types in the cerebellum that don't develop. And it's, this will continue up to about age two. And that the cerebellum does far more than just kind of coordinate action. It's very much involved in thought, executive function, uh, anger management, rage management, motor planning. Cognition, things we didn't think about. So again, th th people are just beginning to get this, try to put this together. Uh, and of course, the biology of all these. Uh, now we're looking at the, the actual uh, receptors themselves, the genes that are involved in regulating their activity. And that's the F5-HCP, is the uh, uh, serotonin transport protein receptor. Uh, and what's interesting about this one is this SS, or uh, the small, short, short derivative is associated with enlarged amygdala. It's also associated with more intense responses to stress and a dysregulation of that pathway I was telling you about that involved the stress hormones and stress reactions. Uh, and so it's very interesting because that's got folks, now well, these are two things that point in the same direction, two separate things. Now these are all nerve growth factors. These are things that what normally, when the brain is migrating, doing what it's supposed to do, doing embryological development, having def those that are defective, uh, may pose some real problems in how the brain organizes itself. And right now there's a whole group of disorders called uh, synucleopathies. The synapses themselves are a aberrant. And the structure of them, how they're built and put together, and how they connect and how they maintain connections is faulty. And so really getting down to fine tune what they're looking for. Now, the problem with fine tuning stuff, you got a great answer here, but how does it explain everything else? There are limits to reductionism. And then uh, I think a this idea of behavioral pharmacology is going to be interesting. What folks are trying to do is not look just at treating symptoms, not a, like a pharmacologic assault on people with autism. We're trying to look at what these drugs are actually doing for learning, for learning extinction behaviors, for changing behavior, for habit reversals, uh, for reversal learning, and you know, begin to understand the pharmacology of those. And I think when you start looking at interventions, uh, this may be a real promising area, but it's also a very scary area. Because this is starting to manipulate how your brain works. And if I want you to be a good conservative gun toting somebody, I can give you the right drugs at the right time and turn you into the you know, next Adolf Hitler or something. Theoretically. But I think that's what the ethical decisions about this are going to be monumental, I think. Uh, now, back to us. Look at what. It's fun to read anthro paleoanthropology textbooks. You go back 50 years, what defined human was walking upright? Well, that occurred six million years ago. But we weren't exactly human six million years ago. Well, then we make tools. Well, chimps make Other animals make tools. Well, we have culture. Well, chimps have culture. We were, we were hunters. No, we weren't. We were hunted. The big hunter mythology going. But again, the, some of the things that we got into that we used to define humanness uh, seem to be impacted by this disorder. Uh, handedness. A lot of people with autism are not hand dominant. If you line up 100 gorillas, you've got a 50 50 chance you're going to get hit with a right hand or a left hand. Humans is going to be about 90% times going to be the right. 
And, so, and, and the tools that were actually dug up at, at Aldivai Gorge, uh, uh, the so-called pebble culture, were predominantly right-handed people doing it, critters doing it. I don't know if you call them people, critters, what do you want to call them? Uh, so again, th all this may set the stage for language. Because one of the arguments about language is that it didn't occur from screaming, crying that a hawk was after me. It probably came from signaling, pointing. Anybody know what that is? That's a Bushman sign for a giraffe. You think about it, you can just show that, and somebody knows exactly what that is. Or pantomiming was a way of those early phases of language. You got named Smith in at Oxford, which is his bag. But really it's fascinating to read his work because what he's talking about is how we use our hands, our gestures that, that pre predate language, and how people who can't speak learn American Sign Language, and how American Sign Language and, and language occur from the same spots in the brain, same part of the left hemisphere. Uh, then neuroplasticity was a big key for us. How to adapt this brain to continue learning. And, uh, you know, I was taught brain stops producing cells at adolescence. It's all downhill from there. Well, not quite. In, in the hippocampus, which involved in memory and a lot of other functions, we're probably producing about 10,000 cells a day, new ones. So neurogenesis is rampant. And in, in enriched environments, these neurons are mature. And if you don't use them, you lose them. If you're under too much stress, too much cortisol, that switches it off. This SS derivative may switch it off. So I think we get down to training people who have autism very early in life. These are the guys you're trying to go after. Well, of course, that's also happening in the prefrontal cortex, but not as intently. And happening in the olfactory cortex, it's smell, which is kind of really interesting. But, uh, but these are all things that kind of differentiate language and how we put the world together. But that's one thing is crucial. Most animals don't like to play as adults. Humans play all the time. I think if you have talked to a few of you guys, take your salary to pay for your hobbies, for your playtime. Uh, but we play with words, we play with ideas, we play with art, we play with everything else. But that seems to be something, and, and we teach very differently, teach people to do things very differently. But I think play is just probably the pinnacle of our evolution, we'll think of something to be able to capacity to play creatively and use symbols and play with them. It's something which just really distinguishes us. And then why this came up, my argument is that, that in one sense, when we got the capacity to do all these things, we, we signed our Faustian bargain to have autism. I think the genes that are involved in developing these areas, when they're aberrant or when something goes wrong with them, we're going to produce this syndrome. Uh, and what we're seeing now is Culture change and culture going affecting evolution faster than natural selection did, much, much faster. And think about it, written language, reading, 5,000 years old. What did people do before that? The Egyptian hieroglyphics are pictographic. But the phonetic alphabets. So written, writing came very, very recently. And look what's happened over the last 5,000 years once we've learned to write how many things we do now, and how many things we do readily. There was an old joke about Charlemagne, Charles the Great of France, that, that he uh, spent, claimed he could speak Greek and Latin, but nobody ever heard him speak Greek or Latin, so nobody challenged the emperor. So, uh, but he couldn't write. Well, fellow never could learn how to write, but he could read. And so writing is much later than reading. And, and most people never read. Somebody read to them. So all these things are happening in the last three, 4,000 years. And what people are arguing is not the genetics that's changing, it's the epigenetics, that the culture is now influencing how genes operate. Uh, and it changes selection pressure. One of the hallmarks of uh, at least some part of evolutionary biology is that, uh, that something may have been adaptive in one environment may not be in another. Or at one time may not. So if you think, what would be the ideal world for somebody with high-functioning autism to, to thrive in? And think about that. So anyway, come, we're going to come back to that. But is it increasing? Big debate. Some people say, yeah, if you live in California, around the country, well, it's a little bit more controversial. Uh, but it seems to be the numbers are rising. Is it a criteria? Aging fathers and aging moms? Well, we've got so many toxins in our environment right now, we don't know what we're breathing and drinking and eating. Uh, or is it popular demand? I know a lot of people get that diagnosis of uh, autistic spectrum disorder, mainly for services. 
I mean, they probably would qualify, but it really helps them get educational services. And then, of course, this whole expanded phenotype. This is what you're going to look at in terms of genetics. This is what you're going to look at in terms of selective advantage. Now, if I'm, uh, I, I got kind of thought of started thinking about it. My, one of my friends decided he got desperate, tried uh, eHarmony, one of those things, that, uh, and tried to match up. And of course, it didn't match with any human on Earth. Uh, <laughs> But it can make you think, now, if, if you can mate and, and meet and survive in a world of computers and electronic engineering, you don't require good social skills, and, and you get very successful at it, uh, that is the niche. Is that the next eco niche for, for people with the, the expanded phenotype? Not the full syndrome, but they, they're going to be carrying the full syndrome with them. So, does it, are we seeing a rise because of the way the world is working now? And and the other thing is, why are so many extraterrestrials like people with a, uh, autism spectrum disorder? Who's ever seen a histrionic, flaming, flamboyant alien? <laughs> and I, you know, every now and then you get one. I got a cue on Star Trek. It's kind of a little bit crazy. But a lot of them are cold, calculating, rational, scientific. You know, think of Spock. Data. Uh, I mean, this is, and is this what we're going to be looking at in the future? So we might be the aliens in those days. These other guys. So the people at autism are going to take over the world. But uh, I think it's going to be an interesting because we are seeing a major change in, in the types of uh, environments that people can be successful in who have really severe social skill deficits and real difficulty with communication and real difficulty relating. And you can follow a computer program and watch some of these guys. I got four-year-olds that can break it, hack into the UNC computer system. You watch them. How do they do that? They can't tell you how they did it. They just did it. So all of a sudden, the screen, a secure screen comes up. I don't know if they watched me do it. They heard the clicks and learned it that way or what. Uh, so again, what I like to think about is you think about, is this a very complex disorder? It's got core features but a lot of variability. There are probably hundreds of genes involved. They probably involve more in the families that have multiple children than those that may have one or those that have severe profound intellectual disability or a known genetic disorder may be different maybe under different selection pressures than people with multiple genes. <coughs> it's culture changing. <coughs> it. We're kind of seeing a dawn of a, a kind of a new era uh, or the beginning of, of one that begins to select very differently than it did for us and live long and prosper. That's what I'm so anybody got any questions? Covered a lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. All right, put you to sleep. But a lot of this is kind of, it's, this is obviously speculation. But I think it's one of the things that, that, that really is intriguing because and, and, because we don't tend to think in terms of the long term where things come from. We look at the, the ontogeny. And I think we have to look at our whole species because this disorder looks very similar across cultures. And there may be subtle differences in, in neuropsychological subtypes or genetic subtypes that are different uh, in different populations, but still display the same disorder, basically the same disorder. Uh, and I think one of the things about us humans is we are, we are compulsive migrators, too. We're a restless species. We just move all over the place. And we've been doing it for at least a million and a half years. Uh, just take on one or, and of course, if you read the textbooks, it's like you know, they lined up and said they were going to America, so they went to America. It really didn't happen that way. But they were exchanging genes all along with everybody. <clears throat> I don't know if you can keep up with the uh, news, but the Neanderthal genome's been isolated, and, and they think they've got a good sense of what's on it. Uh, but they don't share a lot with us, but the 99% we share with apes. Uh, and the fascinating ones is the group of Melanesia. There's a, there was a group of uh, late hominids in, in uh, northern Siberia, Devonichi, that share more in common with the Polynesians than they do with the Europeans. And so well, what, what you begin to see is all these genes get diffused around. As these people migrate what was relatively small populations, now start to mix with other populations. And you see all of this, it may be why so, these genes are so rare uh, now. It may not have been that rare earlier. We don't know. But, but yeah, oh, did oh, sorry. I guess one of the things I would wonder is that I would think earlier life Early historical periods would be more difficult on people that were socially isolated than contemporary life. That if you have to survive on the tribe or the group to make it, 
and kind of old hunting gathering cultures. It seems like inability to form reciprocal relationships would be more of a disadvantage than than in urban societies where there might be more of a social network. So I, it, it it's harder for me to see that the current period would necessarily make it more difficult for people with with autism. Well, I think um, that, that's that's the point that it may be becoming easier but, for the higher function. But you don't think in terms of the autistic spectrum. Think in terms of the, the broad phenotype, because that's what probably is genetic the evolutionary pressure has been on. Not because I think most people in, in primitive society, <clears throat> if you have a, any kind of birth defect, they put you out on a hill and die. And they don't right. look after you. But if you're an old person who developed, like the Neanderthals really looked after. La has got a guy who's in his, probably in his 40s, which is ancient for them. They had really bad arthritis, couldn't walk, and they looked after him. Uh, but they probably wouldn't have done that with an infant. They're just throwing it out. So I guess one question is: this, Did it start to become less and less adaptable uh, uh, because we moved into urban settings, because we went into agriculture, started living in more complex organization, or would it have been more uh, problematic and very rare, uh, you didn't see anybody for six months at a time? And the type of knowledge you had about space, about where things are, had a premium, not how you related. I mean, we don't know, we speculate. That's just as good as any of them. <laughs> you know? Yes, ma'am. You know what the uh, politically correct? Why do they respond to such low doses of medication? Uh, the politically correct question is it's under research. The real question, we don't have a clue. Because uh, if you do blood levels, it's not that the levels are low. And they're not high. So it's not a metabolic problem. We don't do a good job of radioactively tagging things to see if it gets to the receptor it's supposed to. And it's enough of it to bind. My suspicion is what goes on intracellular. That when we look at, we block a serotonin, serotonin levels rise, it, the serotonin goes to a 5-HT2 receptor, that switches on a whole cascade of uh, uh, inhibitory effects of G proteins, which turns on phospholip, uh, phospholinositol triphosphate, all this stuff gets, and then it just it goes on down. It switches on genes, it does all this stuff. Well, serotonin is interesting because it's very si significant in early, very early brain development. It may be very important in amygdala development, which is really fascinating, but I don't know. And it's that way with antipsychotics. And the EPS levels are, tend to occur in much lower doses of, of even the so-called third generation drugs. They don't cause side effects. And again, it's not any of that, but they respond very quickly, and they relapse very quickly. With schizophrenia, I mean, you've got a really hardcore schizophrenic. He, stop, he stops his drug. It'll take a little while for the disease to come back. Well, this would be within 24, 48 hours. And the same thing with SSRIs, a lot. And so, it's not doing what it normally does. And of course, that's independent of what we think are psychiatric disorders, which may change that in the direction of, quote, normality versus just pure autism. Uh, but it's just a, and what's intriguing is what happens when you start trying to manipulate what happens in the cell. Because we use a lot of phospholinositol, inositol, which actually is the pathway that the serotonin receptors operate on. You use that in treatment. Now, I think this is where the directions in, in pharmacology are going to come, not intracellular, not neurotransmitter-wise. Any other questions? We all have time to escape. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hang on.